Hey Kaiju fans, Golden here, and today we're taking a look at the Rodan fodder turned city destroyers, Mega Nulon, Mega Nula, and their mutant queen, Mega Gears. <laughs> Mega Nulon are the nocturnal, semi-aquatic, monstrous larvae of a species of gigantic, prehistoric dragonfly-like arthropods. Introduced as antagonists during the first half of the 1956 film Rodan, they terrorized a coal mining town before being sealed away underground, eventually revealed to be food for one of the title monsters. The bugs disappeared from the movie altogether as the focus shifted to dealing with the two Rodans. The monster bugs returned 44 years later for Godzilla vs. Megaguirus, where the test firing of an anti-Godzilla weapon allowed a member of their species to appear in the present, and leave behind an egg which soon gave rise to thousands of Mega Nulon. Originally inhabiting ancient lakes where they fed on fish and other small animals, the Mega Nulon brought to the present preyed on humans, and created a suitable environment for themselves by digging up enough groundwater to submerge Shibuya. This time, we saw them metamorphose into their adult stage, Meganula, fierce, swarming dragonflies with 16-foot wingspans. Eventually, a 164-foot-long giant Meganulon received energy its subordinates had siphoned from Godzilla, mutating it into Megagirus. Essentially hijacking the climax of a film about the G-Grasper's struggle against Godzilla, the mutant monstrosity challenged the King of the Monsters to a battle to the death in Tokyo, using blinding speed in tandem with her combat abilities to overwhelm him. Nonetheless, Godzilla prevailed in the end. Megagirus returned briefly for a stock footage montage in Godzilla Final Wars, the only non-Showa monster in the sequence. In Godzilla Singular Point, the Mega Nulon were parasites that lived on Godzilla Ultima's skin. For some reason, the audio description track for the episode called them Kamanga. <laughs> Despite them bearing zero resemblance to Kamanga or the related variants in the show, and looking identical to the 1956 Mega Nulon, she and her kin haven't shown up in Godzibon yet, apart from the Mega Nulon berries that Baby Radon loves to eat. The insect monsters that were to be featured in Rodan were originally based on termites, then mole crickets, before Toho finally settled on making them dragonfly nymphs. Teizo Toshimitsu created a clay prototype, and at least ten miniatures of varying sizes were produced too, including a ginyo. The Mega Nulon suit measured almost five meters long, and needed two or three actors at a time to operate its six legs. The visual of one person for each pair of hind limbs is pretty self-explanatory, and it's what most sources repeat. But a couple of books assert the correct answer is apparently two. Quote, it can be inferred that the actor in the back moved the central legs with his hands as if using walking sticks. A second suit-sized prop of at least the upper body was also created. It's seen alongside the proper suit in the Mount Aso cavern interior. Longtime Godzilla series concept artist Shinji Nishikawa designed Megagirus with the film's director, Masaki Tezuka. Special effects director Kenji Suzuki reported a three-month design period for Megagirus and her subjects. Nishikawa details in his book that he wanted to give Megagirus the shape of a hind attack helicopter, exemplified by this considered design, whose head also resembles that of the Showa Mega Nulon. In another concept piece, he contemplated the Insect Queen aspect from an early script, depicting her floating leisurely in the air and commanding a swarm of Meganula to attack on her behalf. Oh, and during that stage, she had the ability to shift space-time. That would have been neat. Despite producer Shogo Tomiyama's request for the monster to have a dragon-like face with a reptilian jaw, Nishikawa found himself unable to deviate from giving the beast anything but insectoid facial features to ensure its, quote, consistency as a creature. This mindset is apparent in much of Nishikawa's Megagirus concept art, as it uniformly features arthropod mouth parts and defined compound eyes. Even on the final decided design concept which was used in the storyboards, and for the advanced poster artwork by Noriyoshi Orai, Megagirus has a lower jaw resembling spiky mandibles, and six wings instead of two. 
The original plan was for the wings to be rendered exclusively with CG. When the decision was made to go with physical manipulation instead, practical considerations dictated the merging of the six wings into a single pair. Ultimately, the final appearance aligns with the vision of a dragon-like face with its defined upper and lower jaws lined with sharp reptilian teeth. Though the design's coloration often appears to be mostly dull gray or muted green, her true color scheme is quite vibrant, involving purple and orange-brown with bright yellow accents. Other striking features are her huge, bulging, bright red eyes and a series of purple-red orbs running down the ventral side of her tail, which seems to just be decorative. There exist earlier concept pieces depicting monstrous rays of light being fired from these orbs, but that's it. Nishikawa designed Meganula and the new Meganulon. Nothing too crazy here. The final concepts reflect what ended up on screen pretty closely. Though it's worth pointing out that the nymph's cool eye pattern was invented during the sculpting stage. A lightweight puppet was made of its upper half by Monsters Inc., with CGI used for any full-body appearances. In order to maximize efficiency, the prop was made to be modular, with detachable legs and two swappable heads, one for the radio-controlled mechanisms and the other without. All of its scenes were shot by Tezuka's drama unit rather than the special effects unit. Although the Meganula were realized through more liberal use of CG, a plethora of small models were created for select scenes by Replica, in cooperation with toy makers Bandai and Fuji Toy. In total, 150 25cm models were produced, along with roughly 10 more with wing flapping mechanisms and a 75cm model for close-ups. The speed at which the wings flapped could be adjusted by changing the frame rate of the camera. Additionally, a full-scale prop of a dead Meganula was used by the drama unit for the scene where it was discovered floating in the ocean. Last but not least, Megagears' props were created by Star Train, another name for modeling company Rainbow, under the supervision of Monsters president Shinichi Wakasa. These included a large flying puppet, a smaller one for solo shots, and, surprisingly, a suit. This was something Tezuka wanted to distinguish her from other flying insectoid kaiju, like Mothra or Batra. This costume was donned by Kamen Rider and Sentai suit actor Minoru Watanabe in his Soul Godzilla series outing, though the models made up the majority of Megagirus' screen time. As in many kaiju builds, fiber-reinforced plastic was used in the suit's construction, specifically for the eyes. For the scene where Megagirus emerges in her final form, a model of the giant Meganulon with a split back was used in combination with the Megagirus suit this time worn by assistant modeler Kakusei Fujiwara. A standalone tail prop was also built for close-ups, with a spring inside the stinger allowing it to retract upon contact with Godzilla. The sadistic grin Megagirus gives as she traps Godzilla was done through a digital morphing effect rather than any practical means. Someone in the effects department evidently discovered Photoshop. Likewise, the high-speed flapping of her wings was the result of digital processing. And no, your DVD's not skipping. The jittering shots of Godzilla during the Odaiba battle are intentional. So says Mr. Suzuki. It's meant to illustrate that when Megagirus is flying at incredible high speed, things appear to move slowly from her perspective. Star Train produced a bipedal Megagirus suit for public appearances too, allowing the performer to actually walk around. Fans have affectionately dubbed the suit Legagirus. It also has a split-second cameo in the 2001 comedy All About Our House. Godzilla Against Mechagodzilla director Tezuka's second Godzilla film was at one time planned to be a sequel to Godzilla vs. Megagirus, with a Meganula swarm appearing at the beginning of the film. Meganulon still exist in the universe of the Kiryu series by way of Rodan, however, and composer Michiru Oshima reworked the Meganula slash Megagirus leitmotif for Mothra in Tokyo SOS. In the setting of the original Rodan, Meganulon are said to have lived between 300 and 200 million years ago, but were resurrected in large numbers as a result of rising geothermal heat and tectonic activity, subsequently proliferating in large caves and coal mines. They wandered to the surface at night in search of prey. We only ever see the larval stage of the Showa Meganulon, but the 1993 book, Encyclopedia of Godzilla, Mechagodzilla Edition, states that the dragonfly-like adult stage measures 10 meters in length. 
As for Godzilla vs. Megaguirus, the in-universe publication Ancient Animal Encyclopedia explains that Meganula, scientific name Meganula Luce, and Meganulon, Meganulon Hori, lived sometime during the Carboniferous period, between 367 and 289 million years ago. Numerous fossils of both were found in China, with another Meganulon fossil unearthed in Germany. Prior to their appearance in present-day Shibuya, it was theorized, but not definitively proven, that the specimens could have represented two stages of the same species. Additionally, it's mentioned in the movie that fossils of a creature similar to Megaguirus were found in eastern China, though we never see these. One book states that these date back to the Cretaceous period, an entire 150 million years after the Carboniferous ended. The monstrous arthropods lay their eggs in water, which then split up and multiply over the course of several days until reaching about 10,000 in total. According to both the movie's theater program and the book Godzilla vs. Megaguirus Super Complete Works, one of the eggs will grow continuously without dividing and give rise to a giant Meganulon. An alternate explanation presented elsewhere asserts that a dominant Meganulon from the pack simply grows massive prior to maturing. Either way, the other individuals will metamorphose into their flight-capable adult stage within a few days. Only one out of 1,000 Meganula can lay eggs, the rest existing to give energy to Megagirus. Acting in pacts to take on enemies and protect their young, they attack other powerful creatures to steal their life force, transferring it to the giant Meganulon, and giving up their lives in the process. Upon molting, it emerges as a Megagirus and becomes the leader of the clan. Several sources reiterate her behavior as seeking to expand the clan's territory, and doing so through brutal conquest. Once again in the Super Complete works, the Terabicoon editorial staff posit that, for the preservation of the species, Meganula would have needed the fighting capability to protect Meganulon from external forces. Perhaps it is for this purpose that the leader monster Megagirus evolved. It can be inferred that Meganula attacked and absorbed the energy from the most powerful organisms around their breeding territory, and must have injected it into one of their companions in order to create the vicious combat beast Megagirus and eliminate their natural enemies. The peaceful coal mining village of Kitamitsu in Kyushu was rocked by a series of grisly killings in the mines. The local authorities struggled to find the culprit until it suddenly appeared and terrorized the village, a Meganulon. Engineer Shigeru Kawamura led a JSDF detachment through the flooded mine to exterminate the Meganulon, successfully crushing it with a minecart. However, there were several more of the creatures and a subsequent cave-in trapped Shigeru with them. Shigeru soon found himself in a huge underground cavern filled with Meganulon, as well as a gargantuan egg which hatched into the giant pterosaur, Rodan. The hatchling fed on the Meganulon as Shigeru watched, struck with such terror that he developed amnesia for some time thereafter. By August 2001, in a continuity where Godzilla was never killed by the Oxygen Destroyer in 1954 and returned continuously to menace mankind, the G-Graspers, the Japanese Self-Defense Force's elite anti-Godzilla unit, had completed their ultimate weapon, a gun capable of firing a miniaturized black hole with the potential to send the monster into oblivion. Around the end of the month, they test-fired this weapon, codenamed Dimension Tide, on an abandoned school just outside of Tokyo. While the test was a success, the lingering distortion in space-time allowed a Meganula from the Carboniferous to wander into the present day. The giant arthropod laid an egg that was found by young Jun Hayasaka, who dumped it into the sewers under Shibuya when it began to secrete slime. Over the course of a few days, the egg split up and multiplied into several thousand more, which hatched into the Meganula's nymph stage, Meganulon. They backed up Shibuya's sewers, gradually causing the streets to flood. The night of September 3rd, a grown Meganulon brutally killed a pair of civilians before climbing up the side of a building and molting into its adult stage. It flew out south of the Ogasawara Islands, where it was killed by Godzilla with a glancing blast of atomic breath. The occurrence was soon detected by the G-Graspers, prompting them to investigate. They found the carcass of the creature and brought back a tissue sample for analysis. The task of examining the cells fell on biologist Tsuyoshi Yamaguchi, who confirmed the organism was a Meganula from the Carboniferous. Shibuya had become almost entirely submerged by September 7th. 
two days later, thousands of Mega Nulon molted in mass. Unfazed by the handful of JSDF soldiers on the scene, they promptly flew to the island of Kikenjima, where the G-Graspers aimed to fire the Dimension Tide against Godzilla. The Horde swarmed the King of the Monsters and siphoned portions of his atomic energy, though his heat ray and raw strength eventually cut their numbers down. The Dimension Tide's firing was unsuccessful in defeating Godzilla, and the surviving Meganula returned to Shibuya to deliver the stolen energy to the giant Meganulon that lay at the bottom of the flooded streets. The Dragonflies relinquished their energy in exchange for their lives, and the gigantic Naiad soon molted into something even more monstrous. Megagirus emerged from the lake at 9.30pm and flew off into the night. Godzilla made landfall in Odaiba the following afternoon in search of a hidden plasma reactor in the city, but instead found himself confronted by the power-hungry Megagirus. She delivered the first blow, kick-starting their duel. The high-speed flapping of her wings had the unexpected consequence of interfering with the Dimension Tide, causing it to fall from orbit, and taking the G-Grasper's Griffin out of commission as well. While Megagirus's speed granted her an immediate advantage against Godzilla, once he began anticipating her attack patterns, he intercepted her repeatedly, ultimately biting off her stinger in his jaws. The dazed and wounded Megagirus backed up into the sky, and was promptly incinerated by two sequential atomic blasts. He was about to get sucked into a black hole, but for the time being, the King of the Monsters had earned another victory. As Yun Arikawa and Jet Jaguar prepared to confront Godzilla Ultima, they briefly encountered a few Mega Nulon on the monster's skin. Yun evaded them while recovering his backpack. Mega Nulon's primary weapons are their large, razor sharp claws, or pincers. The 1956 Mega Nulon's pincers are comparable in sharpness to a Japanese sword, her a character in Rodan. Naturally, an individual's sharp teeth aid in feeding. The Millennium Nulon had fangs on its lower mandible, which we fleetingly see it extending out towards prey. At first, you may think this is just a rehash of Destoroya and or the Xenomorph, but it turns out that real Odonata larvae actually do possess a hinged labium, a toothed mouth part similar to a lower jaw, sometimes called a mask as it is normally folded up below the face. <coughs> the hard shells of the original Mega Nulon are impervious to machine gun bullets. The second generation doesn't seem to be as hardy. We see one stumbling off a building after a single shot. The Mega Nulon from vs. Megagirus are quite speedy despite their size. They can also stealthily crawl up and down the sides of buildings. Moreover, they spit a sticky black liquid to intimidate and disorient prey. Nishikawa says it's mucus. Unlike most dragonfly nymphs, which are fully aquatic, both incarnations of Mega Nulon are amphibious. The larva's nocturnal hunting behavior is aided by their infrared vision. This allows them to detect other living organisms even in pitch darkness. The mini-SGS unit used for underwater exploration of the submerged Shibuya was destroyed by a magnetic field generated by the giant Mega Nulon. Mega Nula reached speeds of up to Mach 2 when flying, twice that of sound, or nearly 1500 miles per hour. That's 500% the top speed of the fastest animal in the real world, the Peregrine Falcon. Like their modern counterparts, they may also hover in midair and change direction suddenly. Megagirus, meanwhile, can achieve Mach 4 flight. Godzilla struggled to keep up with her in their fight whenever she went sicko mode. She can flap her wings at such high speed that they generate ear-piercing ultra-high frequency waves capable of destroying surrounding objects and interfering with electronic equipment. Megagirus prefers dealing damage in close quarters. Her repertoire of techniques involve her enormous, scissor-like claws, sharp wings, a Godzilla-like maw lined with sharp teeth, and a three-pointed barbed stinger. When she stabs her opponent with the stinger, the needle in the center absorbs energy, while the spikes on either side pinch down to help secure it in place. She impaled Godzilla in the abdomen and siphoned some of his energy, to the point that he was unable to use his atomic breath while jabbed. Megagirus' sole ranged weapon is an intense fireball of sorts, which she projects from her abdomen. It toppled Godzilla the one time she used it. One could easily interpret this as her stealing the Big G's atomic breath, like she'd later do unambiguously in Rulers of Earth. 
but retcons notwithstanding, what was this attack actually supposed to be? As it turns out, stuff from around GXM's release only ever described it as high-frequency waves that turned into an energy sphere without a solid connection to Godzilla. The storyboards describe it as shockwaves she generates with her body. Still, sources published later on do at least corroborate the notion that the discharge was powered by the energy she stole from Goji. Regardless of original intent, the arena fighters Godzilla Save the Earth and especially Godzilla Unleashed ran with the idea of Megaguirus copying Monster's special weapons, basically making her into these games' very own Kirby. Minus the cute costume changes. Unlike every other character in these games, she can't build up an energy meter on her own, requiring her to use power-ups or stealing opponents' energy by stabbing them with her stinger. She's capable of imitating the ranged attacks of most monsters in Save the Earth, even the mechanical ones, with some exceptions. In Unleashed, however, she can steal and fire every kaiju's ranged attack from her tail, even Anguirus's sonic roar, as strange as that is. Once she's got enough energy built up, but doesn't have a freshly stolen compatible weapon on standby, she can launch an energy discharge like the one in the movie. She also has the exclusive ability to steal her opponent's health to restore her own. Megaguirus's rage attack in Save the Earth stuns an opponent with waves of Meganula, erroneously called Meganulon in the manual, similar to Legion in Gamera 2. She fights alongside her swarm in Godzilla Cataclysm, although it's unclear whether she's actually controlling them. <coughs> Megaguirus is pretty much the definition of a glass cannon. While she deserves credit for surviving Godzilla's sky-high body slam, he sliced off one of her claws with his dorsal fin, shattered her stinger with a bite, and utterly annihilated her with two shots of atomic breath. Frankly, she looked toast after the first blast. But after the pummeling he just withstood, it's hard to blame him for double-tapping. In Rulers of Earth, she survived a direct hit from Godzilla's nuclear pulse, but other IDW comics have retained her vulnerability to beam attacks. You could say that the origin of Meganula and Megaguirus trace all the way back to the pre-production of Godzilla vs. Mothra. Among several proposals for the next Godzilla film put forward right before the release of Vs. King Ghidorah was Micro Super Battle Godzilla vs. Gigamoth. Of the three Gigamoth designs brainstormed for this initial iteration of the project, the A-type Gigamoth, designed by Shinji Nishikawa, was modeled after dragonflies, and more specifically, the idea of a mature Meganulon. His notes at the time of drawing were included in his 2016 art book, Drawing Book of Godzilla. He contends that although it would basically be a wire-operated prop, it would allow a suit actor inside to control the head, claws, and body. This is almost exactly how the Mega Gira suit would be configured nearly a decade later. Other notes address the logic of the matchup, acknowledging it wouldn't be likely for even the metamorphosed adult stage of the Mega Nulon from Rodan to be large enough to scale with the Heisei Godzilla. However, he brings up news reports at the time about the use of nuclear weapons in coal mining by the Soviet Union, which, quote, could be used to suggest that the Mega Nulon that lived there grew to giant size, unquote. Additionally, if the scissor forearms were maintained, it's possible that livestock attacked by the adult Mega Nulons would show an aspect very similar to the cattle mutilations associated with UFOs, adding a little twist in the scenario, unquote. Mr. Nishikawa was certainly up to something with this idea. They should have let him cook. Next, alien dragonflies turned up in the Godzilla Super War story proposal, which evolved into Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. Rather than the God of Destruction trapping little Godzilla inside a crystal prison on Boss Island, the dragonflies would fly him to Mount Aso, then encase him and much of the surrounding area in crystal. Described as symbiotes of Space Godzilla and his vanguard, they would try fighting Godzilla themselves only to be annihilated in a single instant. Despite their being constantly referred to as insects and dragonflies, the Meganulon and Meganula would in reality not be considered insects, as they possess four pairs of jointed limbs, whereas all insects only have three pairs by definition. 
The very dragonfly nymphs and Carboniferous Meganera, which inspired these kaiju, only possess six legs. Even in the early concept art from back in 1956, all based on hexapods, Meganulon are drawn with eight overall appendages, six legs plus a couple foreclaws. Curiously, the Meganulon minifigure included in the Godzilla vs. Megaguirus Bandai Blister Pack set, released when the movie came out, did have six total extremities like real insects. A column by the Terabikun editorial staff, included in the GXM Super Complete Works book, presents the theory that Megagirus's physiology changes depending on the donor of the energy the Meganula inject, offering an explanation as to why her face is structured like that of a reptile. The surrounding pages also include anatomical diagrams of the three stages of the species' life cycle. Labeled are antennae, hearts and brains, malphigian tubules, and so on. Meganula and Megagirus are specified to possess book lungs, stated to allow them to remain active underwater for long periods. Moreover, the red orbs of Megagirus's tail are explained to be energy storage spheres, and, in addition to the carapace of her relatives, she's drawn as having an actual skull, though the column doesn't ever mention she has an internal skeleton. Oh, and, uh, time for some cool bug facts. Check this out. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, so, upon learning this information, you might be asking, is Meganulon canonically capable of propelling itself underwater by shooting water out of its anus? Yes. Yes, it is. Megagirus's video game career started with the last three Godzilla titles published by Atari. She's a playable character in Godzilla Save the Earth and Unleashed, and the first boss of the Paris stage in Double Smash. Her bio in the Unleashed manual expands her interests, saying she thrives by parasitically siphoning energy from larger animals, and has a primal thirst for power. Then came the almost obligatory parts in Kaiju Collection and Defense Force. She's been in Godzilla Battle Line since its launch, with a unique ability to slow down nearby enemies when she's summoned. That can cause some headaches, especially for ground units who can't attack her, although she tends to be less popular than other five-cost flying units. Still, with how often the game's units are buffed and nerfed through balance patches, her status in the meta is subject to change. This just in. Literal hours before the video was supposed to go up, a new Godzilla VR arcade game was announced, and Megagirus is supposed to appear in it. Glad we caught that in time. Meganulon appeared in the 1956 Rodan manga, their design pasted straight from the concept art. There is a one-shot for Godzilla vs. Megagirus from Besatsu Koro Koro comic, but we don't own it. It's very rare. In the Godzilla anime prequel novels, multiple Megagirus fed on European refugees traveling through Siberia after Godzilla devastated the continent. They had a rivalry with the Rodans, who also drove Meganula into North Africa and feasted on Meganulon in the Himalayas during the preparations for Operation Great Wall. In IDW's Godzilla comics, Megagirus is usually a mid-card monster. She came to the defense of her Meganulon in Godzilla Rulers of Earth, besting both Ebira and Godzilla in Sao Paulo. Her fortunes turned after dragging Godzilla to her nest. He wiped out the nest with a nuclear pulse, and the trilopods arrived to interrupt their fight, stealing her powers in a reversal of roles. They didn't abduct her like most of the Earth's monsters, forgetting about her after Godzilla chucked a dead alpha trilopod at her back. In the post-apocalyptic Godzilla Cataclysm, Megagirus and her Meganula swarm tried feeding on what little remained of Biolante. Mothra took care of the swarm while Godzilla shredded one of Megagirus's wings with his atomic breath. Godzilla Rage Across Time Issue 3 casts her as the lead villain, battling knights and Mothra in England during the Black Plague. The other bug kills her with her wing lightning. Cool subfossil. Also, this one's notable for featuring a Showa Meganulon. Most recently, she appears fleetingly in Godzilla vs. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, landing only one hit against Godzilla before the Megazord's apparently invisible cranial laser takes her out. Due in part to her film's underperformance at the box office, Megagirus hasn't received the most love from Toho, but I still think she's pretty cool. 
much like the two-legged lizard from the original King Kong, which inspired the skull crawlers in the MonsterVerse, the humble Mega Nulon has come a long way. Thanks for watching. Megagyrus.